Hey there, everybody. This is Tavo DRC. We're going to talk cross-body unity and the different things that people do in their groups that make new laws. The legalism of the modern-day ministry, every denomination, we're for them. We're for a doctrinal examination and reform in some places, or even in every country, to say who and what and am I, am you, purely Bible, organic, according to the first church. That means without all the hoops and bells and whistles that we're used to, the red flags, but also not PC and and definitely diverse, but going to the community, the core Bible, not our pet gifting and training and leadership. Because I noticed in my time studying the by you know, the body of Christ, I was sent in nineteen seventy six on that it was not until uh, the Holy Spirit and television came to America that I started to hear about the new Levitical patriarchism and the different need to be undercovered, all that. I never heard of witch watching in the old, that was totally foreign. But we can go back, it promoted me, it called me to study who and what in, is real, and then what is fantasy entertainment. But also, am I true, if Jesus were to come and I was to go alone before the throne and you are alone before, you want to be ready. And that's the big thought, getting the bride of Christ, the pure-hearted bride to examine itself, examine its leadership, examine its priority, examine its you know, own heart, and then teach the community. And then after that, it will be the transformed body of Christ, Ephesians 4, which makes Jesus proud, very happy, but it makes the body effective in society, and that's the bottom line. We can have the picture of the, because you got to spell it out, everybody's so etched in concrete in ministry of like our styles, you know, our kind, no more, our color, our kind, so there are all sorts of things you want to say, now who, what are the voices, the overview voices. There's the Eternal Father. In the New Testament, there's no word curse. Okay, there's no law, no jumping people in public. You know, you sinner, you dog, all that stuff. All right, that's the law. That is Phariseeism. When we have the core basic view of the Bible in eternal proportions, that would be Jesus Christ is the main voice. Jesus Christ, his life on earth, why he came, his purpose, his ministry, and then without the law, he fulfilled the law. Godly contentment is part of that. Joy is part of it. Hebrews 1, 1 and 5, the office ministries, which we could go on and I have taught on. I'll teach it again. But then we have Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John going about doing good healing all those who are oppressed by the devil and the Lord is with him, Acts 10, 38 as well. But I would say if you want to start with what and who is pure, myself included and you, and who you listen to and who you like on TV, who you don't, I would say read the Bible, the good news, the gospels means good news, not gossips, and read it through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and see how Jesus acted Jesus Christ acted and reacted in every relationship, and that will help you determine who is not, you know, who's under the law, who's not. Some of these things are false teaching, or they're not accurate, respectful, maybe gender biased, ministry biased. So you can read that for yourself. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The next thing would be Apostle Paul. Now, Apostle Paul was not wanted by the first 12 disciples because he came after. He came, he was not one of the ones, the first church apostles, who was handpicked, spirit led to divinely meet them, mentor them, you know. So he comes along, but he had been a red flag to the church. He had been a Torah LP. A sign of the LP is Paul. Before he got to be Paul, he was Saul. The Saul spirit that was in Old Testament upon King Saul and David, trying to attack, accuse, frustrated, oppressed, by the new move, threatened. Then that was the same spirit, targeting spirit on the, against the first church, which was on Saul in the New Testament, who later met the Lord 
and the scales and the legalism, the, you know, turf protecting, the righteous, you know, the righteous scripture. We're going to get rid of those, those usurpers, those Christians. They're, you know, not under the law. That type of fruit that I just demonstrated, harlots, you know, all that Americana, that is a sign of the law in New Testament church. So we're looking and say, all right, let's read Jesus. Now let's read Paul through the eyes of, to me, even though he's got all these wonderful teachings, precepts, rules, and all those things, fellowshiping of the saints from such turn away fellowships, community. We're going to focus on community because what is needed is a transformed society. And if we're not teaching the true Bible council, the whole Bible council, and there's no holy fear of the Lord in Christian ministry, in leadership, then you know something is off in the churches, the houses, the families, and society. And if anything, that is the point. <laughs> so you go through the eyes of Apostle Paul to teach what God wants taught, and that is authority. It's not negative authority. It is mutual submission in the fear of the Lord, Ephesians 5.22. Everybody humbling themselves, Ephesians 4, walking it out in meekness and lowliness and long-suffering, endeavoring to keep the bonds of peace together in ministry, training the ministries and families and society. All that plus knowledge, if you read Ephesians 4, the secret is the common doctrine that unifies the community. Not everybody will have, we know the same opinion Levitical patriarchs and matriarchs will want their way and all these other people have their fine tune you know I've met many kinds because I was studying the body the body of Christ for unity you can have some that are uh, wonderful people and they'll have one thing they really stuck on you got to say it this way if you're going to baptize somebody you never say it in Father Son and Holy Spirit you're going to only say Jesus name only so that is your choice whether you wear dresses, no slacks, that is not my business If unless I join your group and God sends you. You know, that is your choice. Everybody's got to have their choice and hear God. I think in light of that type of thing, when I was, you know, I have, I've worshipped with Pentecostals and things or people that have the, that believe in the women wearing dresses and that's fine. No makeup, that is your choice. I'm not... I think for myself, I never grew up around that. I don't feel that, but I honor them for it. And I thought, you know, nobody on this earth will do it the right way. All of us, none of us. Maybe God will give you some of the real revelation that is there to challenge me or others. And that it is up, you know, if the Lord quickens us to that and it is their choice. So you can have people that God puts to mystify us all with different kinds of groups, flows, presentations, but you can't have but so much false doctrine. Your conscience shouldn't let you stay there if it's really false, and your Bible should confirm it is really false. Get out. So we're looking for community, and we're looking for who is pure authentic in the Bible, organic, without human additives, and if you're not going to teach community, if you're not teaching already that you're supposed to be a part of the body of Christ, and walk it out, and you're into all this false teaching, you're false. You're technically false. So within that, that's a giant, you know, red flag. False apostles, false, you know, they're always, certain groups really get into that, and I roll with it, but listen, you're going to have nobody 100% true except Jesus. So, because I prayed about this, I've thought about it, I've been around a long time, my daddy was a pat, you know, I just know this is the way to think about it. So you're going to have really false prophets, real false. Do not follow them, they'll lead you to damnation. All right. That's the big one everybody's looking for. But you don't teach it, you got to teach it. There are partially true that are saved. And then some that are truer than most, and some are least, you know, the dangerous kind, like the dysfunctional, friendly for our fellowship, 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, 1 Timothy 6, 5, from such turn away, that type. And worse, cults, you know. 
So after you get to the deep part of how false can you be before they're really bad, you're dangerous, that is you and good teaching and asking people. And, you know, nobody, we shouldn't go around like, the more people, what I found after since the 80s on up, getting with more of the spirit-filled cr the crowds where they look for false prophets, usually they go for, you know, LP looks for more. It was like, listen, nobody's perfect. They're all false in some ways. You can't go around just vilifying everybody. So that's happening now in our nation because on these YouTube videos, which are my peeve, you know, I saw Billy Graham. They don't like anybody. People will find, you know, that's their choice. But we're talking about it to stir it up, to train it, let you think and also train. So nobody was perfect except Jesus and his doctrine. Even Paul said... He commended the Berean Jews for picking apart his doctrine to see if it was really so. He even said to all of us, know me, know my lifestyle, know my doctrine. And he also said for all of us, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That means everybody, male, female, black, white, or brown, or whatever you want to be these days. You know, you got to hear from God and I'm not going to, I'm not going to change the gospel I'm not going to change the Bible to suit society, but I do believe we really should and we can and we really want to change the approach of the presentation of how we do it. It is just reviling people. It is controlling. It's got witchcraft, false authority. All right, back to Paul. Big voices in the New Testament would be Jesus Christ going about relating and you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John how he acted and reacted with his mother with women, with sinners, all that stuff and that's how we act then we have Paul Paul writes community he was against the Christian community when he was Saul that may be a sign right there Paul was attacking he was merciless He, you know, he murdered people because he was back blinded by the Pharisee Torah law, the overseer law. When Paul got the knocked off his high horse and he met the Lord and fell in love with the Lord, you know, then he was sent not a part of the first church. He wouldn't let to be helped. He didn't want, they didn't want him. He met with Barnabas and he met with Paul, excuse me, he met with um, Peter for two weeks. It didn't go well. So he was not it wasn't the timing. So Paul said, and see all the people that teach all these, you know, you got to be under, he, you know, all this stuff, rules. You look at Paul. Paul said, even though he was under them, technically in the spiritual age, he came after them and they were all in place by Christ. There was none of this format like we got now. All these people. Paul said, I did not confer with flesh and blood. And they didn't want him. He got, the, as someone said, the left foot of fellowship from the first church at first. All right, because he had been Saul and they didn't trust him. But he had a different vibe also. I believe he didn't have a different, because I have a different vibe from the LP and we like the LP. But listen, we have to train people now across by the unity. You know, let's all figure it out. Maybe we're not all alike, but we're all equal and deserving of respect. White, black, brown, any color, mixed. So Paul had to hear God because he was having all this bias from the church, the religious spirit of their, you know. Paul said, I didn't confer with flesh and blood. And the Lord said, go to be with the Arabs up in Damascus, Syria. So he was there 14 years, 13, 14 years, getting milled and sifted, getting to know the Gentiles, which was later his call. The office called, Paul was sent to the Gentiles, Peter to the Jews, and he got, you know, Paul, because I've, I've just learned some of this through the last many years of being <laughs> in, in doctrine, I was never raised around dysfunctional ministry, frankly, that you have to learn your, you have to know your accusers so you can deal with them and, you know, love them and not be moved. So I realized that Paul had been steeped, even though he got delivered, he's no longer an LP, he was Paul now, not Saul, 
his whole life had been immersed in the Torah, so he had a cultural, emotional hard drive, mental reactions, you know, some things God needed to work out of him, which is life process. The process and the progress. All right. So Paul is sent in a weird way. He wanted to help out, but they didn't want him, so he was sent because the Lord said, go up, don't waste your time, and go up to be with the Arabs. So he's up with the Arabs, and to me, he got immersed in the culture of the Arabs, who were Gentiles. He had been immersed in Torah law all his life, steeped in it. And so when he was up there, he got to see their human side. They were humans that God loved them. He saw their families, their children. He got to meet with them as real people. See, that's what a lot of LPs, I'm not, you know, you got to love people. You got to know them, not just be immersed in your own tribe and all your people under you look, you know, same thing. You got to really hang out <laughs> and relate to people and have a community because you got to get diverse, not faking it but really loving. I would say to point back to Hebrews 10.25, which is the writing of Paul, please don't forsake fellowship with the saints as some have. That's right. But it's not a word curse. You don't accuse people if they don't go. You train them and then leave it up to them and respect them. But I would say a lot of the people aren't getting what they think when they go to a word curse fellowship, one that's Second Timothy 3 with the wrong fruit. All right, that's going to attack them. <laughs> they have their right to go. When we look at, we need to look at the organic. I'm pointing back to the Old Testament to Isaiah 56, verse 7. Now, in Isaiah 56, verse 7, we know that in the Old Testament, they were under the law, and they said, you've got to go, the, you know, Jewish law to the Hebrew people, you got to go on Friday night, shut everything down, don't work at all, and worship the Lord for a Sabbath in your community and individually on Saturday. All right, Friday to Saturday. So the teaching was in Isaiah 56, still applies for the bonus blessing. All right, not legalism, not hitting people hard. You're not in church, you're, un, you know, you're just all this stuff. You know, all these people, you're a fornicator. Oh, that same tone is all law, all right, and tradition. So when we look at Isaiah 56 and a new light, not under legalism, not under word curses, not under punishment, scolding, you're not going to church because Paul said, don't forsake fellowshipping with his saints. You know, all these people have done that. They do that especially some of the groups that moved up in the cares, you know, that I <laughs> never knew. And they moved into their area and they started watching everybody. Who are they under? You're some, that's what got me started to study the doctrines, you know, and what it does to people. And how it, that same group started coming up in the, I guess, the slowly in the 90s. And the churches started to have people leave. Is that tied? I don't know. I call it the Barney Pew Survey. <laughs> Not the Barna pew, that's mature. This is Barney, the little purple guy, you know. <laughs> Infants, got to get some growth and maturity, respect to all kind, you know. It was a culture that is now a giant culture now of this, certain places. Phariseeism, Phariseeism, good old boyism. Nouveau riche, good old boyism. That's my, my study has found around America. So Isaiah 56 is a wonderful quality, get fresh vision on fellowshipping in the saints. It says, back then, Isaiah 56, the prophet of the nation, Isaiah, gave a word of the Lord. It said, God pronounces his blessing on anybody who goes to carve out time to give him a worship him on a Sabbath. The blessing, the commanded blessing of those who go and worship, those who carve out time, whether they're simple, whether they're pitiful, whether they're elegant, whether they're from another nation, everybody who wants to go to before the Lord and worship Him has got a commanded blessing. Got to read that. I like that because I met, when I met Showbiz before now, when I met Showbiz, I'd never seen hail fellow well met, easily dismissed by type. I never saw that. I never saw 
accusation just for wanting to say hello and thank him for the sermon. I mean, like, checking your watch, it's just a woman. Oh, I've never seen that. My daddy, I was with pastors all my life before that. But we, you know, it didn't, it's a shock em. I'm doing this really to stir it up, to teach, to get people all like, oh, I better not do that. People know <laughs> that's what we're doing. Shock and awe. Faithful are the wounds of a friend to the boys club. All right. And the girls club and the mammon club. So when I was there, I thought, let's figure out, you know, all these people in Dallas, let's say the area, the region with millions of churchgoers or hundreds of tens of thousands, you know, but then many, many millions, it was right, 8 million people, 6 million people back then that don't go. And the church numbers were going down in America. And I knew why. I knew why. Dysfunction. You know, off course, off core doctrine. And I'm not angry with these people, uh, the charismatics, the prophetic, the white, the, ch you know, this kind of showbiz. I'm not angry. I'm, I'm righteously upset and fed up for Jesus Christ and people perishing. That's all. You can't go. There's no, there's no love. There's no holy fear of the Lord. No discernment. N not even valuing and respecting a person who chooses to come and probably puts money in your plate. That is what stir. You know, that's what stirs me up. I would call it dysfunction and bias. All right. So God drove me, pulled me to the Word, and I started to get all these things I teach now. Isaiah 56 says. That if, uh, and some of the things was impatience, the foolish little woman stereotype. It's a, oh, it's only another woman in this culture. It's just a weak willed woman probably coming to take over, probably got emotional baggage dripping down. You know, never. <laughs> That's charismatic. I never had been around that. I saw it and it was done and I, I bring it out. I had to teach it now to deliver it. So I think, you know, it ain't about us getting people and herding them into the churches, especially if they're like that, the fruit you meet. It is about Holy Spirit telling them, I want you to go here or don't go there, and them having the freedom and the respect to hear God and not be shamed, accused, big bossed, or lied about that they're out of order. You know, all this subculture is giant. So Isaiah 56 says to anybody who goes and wants to worship the Lord and honor him on a Sabbath, it's your choice. It says when you show up, there is a commanded blessing and it says it's to the eunuch, to the foreigner, anybody. The eunuch is big because a eunuch means they're not perfect. They've had something that damaged them. The eunuchs were these, they usually helped at the uh, Levites at the door and they held the door. They were castrated males. But it could be somebody who is weak, lost their job, not all as mature as you'd like. And I thought of really, it's like Jesus Christ and saying, suffer the little children to come into me. Because I realized that when I was seeing this, this subculture, this giant, thick, subculture I thought it's a poor me spirit all this money it's a poor me spirit you know one more person I got to talk to them and they're going to take my time some some female or whatever who's not red state like you there's somebody that you know they're not fancy they're feeling bad I had some trauma down there but I was there for this reason to learn what goes on really in a giant you know package to some, you know systems so i thought of jesus and the you know if you got anybody any size church anywhere in america that is restless that the person who's coming up you know just to visit knows you're irritated because you showed up <laughs> it's not good i had i went to you know i would be led of the lord to visit the area and I noticed this was only one doctrine, the patrician LP system type of doctrine that produces that. I went to a famous, very well-known 
Baptist church, Quality Baptist was on TV, Quality, and I thought they'd be all white, but they had it was trying to be diverse and they raised their hands and they were more um red state than i you know i prefer to keep jesus purple state vote by issue the bible and everything but i went there there was warmth fear of the lord and after the service this giant mega church friendly baptist in dallas and i went and there was the head pastor the founder pastor at the door ready to shake her hand and when I walked up I'd been around all this little woman all this little misogyny misogyny and oh it's only a woman and when I and hurry her off hurry her off and when I got there he wanted he was just as respectful it was like respect and I noticed its doctrine and people the people he took his time he asked me questions you can't do that but it is an added it is a spiritual revelation of people who really love and are not poor me victims of time you know so that's why I'm teaching Isaiah 56 verse 7 because it says even the eunuch the person you don't think is good enough for you at your group you got to humble yourself Jesus Christ was on his mission in the New Testament and the little children were there and surely his disciples, his apostles were saying, come on, Jesus, we got we got to get there on time. You're the guest speaker. I don't know what he was doing that day. So there these little kids were with their little grubby hands playing. And Jesus went over because he respected them. He valued them. They were the future leadership, you know, but he loved them anyway, whether they're leaders or not. He goes over there to the little urchins or whatever these little kids are. And the disciples said, come on, Jesus, come on. You know, they're getting checking their watch a little bit haughty. In ministry so Jesus said suffer the little children to come unto me for theirs is the kingdom of heaven theirs is the kingdom of heaven what does it mean in light of Isaiah and the eunuch and the weak person the emotional time you know your stereotype of the typecast society of ministry suffer the little children theirs is the kingdom they the weaker person, the weaker vessel, the weaker person that isn't your kind, that you're typecast, or a little kid, or a black person, or white, or any, in your fellowship is a little kid to you because you think you're more superior, you know, self-righteous, but you suffer. Some people, you got to suffer with people because God has sent them as your test, our test. Suffer the little children, the one that tests your patience, the kid or the grown-up, the mature man, woman, or child. I mean, really, that is what he, it's old timey back again. I, it was Big Boss Ministry. I have never in my days, I have never been around that club. I've never. So it got me really passionate to speak to get people to be able to want to go to church. We want you to be. God wants them there, and you keep that keeps people out. It makes them, it accuses people, it abuses people. It, it's just, it's biased, but it's also chauvinist, but it's also whatever that is. It isn't just women, it's an atypical people. It's not organic. So organic, I'm going to teach you is Isaiah 56, verse 7. Here's the fruit of the Isaiah 56, verse 7, real fellowship that is could be today if you really go and you find the anointing the Holy Spirit the real peace of God so that you can parallel Hebrews 10 25 the command the instruction don't forsake fellowshipping well I'm making it because it's so bad it's been so negative I'm thinking you hear God be very careful and if they're not nice they're like Paul said to get out get out and start your own or go somewhere else you know keep on praying don't give up meet in the back room of some house or something better than have you know none that's why God has given online churches if you can't find anybody you can go online Isaiah 56 verse 7 is the fruit the pure fruit of a quality fellowship a real life God fellowship that he wants whether it's small big mega or micro it says 
when you go, your commanded blessing by God is to be this. Okay? God says, I will take you to my holy mountain. I will make you joyful in my house of prayer. Your burnt offerings will, and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar and my house. It's his house and his houses. My house will be a house of prayer for all people. There'll be an undercurrent, you know, people of all colors, all nations will feel safe, but there'll be an undercurrent, a thread of the reverential, holy fear of the Lord. People really wanting to pray, others centered in a community on target for God's causes, not a lost cause, but his cause, valuable. You want to have people, you can pray with them. They can pray for you. There's so many things. Isaiah 56, it says, I will take you, says the Lord, to my holy mountain. What does that mean? I will take you to my holy mountain. When you show up and you come with all your heart to worship me and fellowship and, you know, have a Sabbath, I will take you to my holy mountain. That means I will give you like Moses went to the mountain and got the revelation of the Ten Commandments in Isaiah, excuse me, Exodus 33. You will have something when you go in and you're truly, you know, in a good place. You have to be in a good place, though. You have to be in the right place or you won't get this. But you can also work on it, understanding it. When you go to the Holy Mountain, that means you walk in, you've had stress, you've had life, you'd have trial. So you're carving out time with God to be with him, and he wants to bless you back. And during the sermon, during the music, during the fellowship, or some kind of idea will pop in your head like a light, or you'll get a touch from the Lord. Unless you get accused by some evil eye, false doctrine, you know. So there you are, you're able to get up out of yourself into the touch of, you know, the peace, present power of the Lord, a word of the Lord, an idea, you know, that type of thing is a revelation that you didn't have before. God used the atmosphere of his anointing and fellowshipping, you know, with the saints, the collect, let's see, the collective anointing. You can have the individual anointing, two or three are gathered, but then you have the corporate anointing is stronger if they're all in a, if it's a quality group a quality ministry and they know how to really go to the Lord it isn't just conniving or striving or whatever too strict so God says the promises your blessing for going all right I will take you to my holy mountain that means out of yourself into you know a touch of the Lord or a word of the Lord guidance from the Lord whatever I will take you to my holy mountain. I'll make you joyful in my house of prayer. That means you're, when you do things for the Lord that he tells you, not what other people, but when you know it's God, it will be joy. Praying for people, praying, getting direction, helping people work. It will be he will do it because you've been led by the Spirit specifically to do it. All right? You're on track for the Father. So he's honoring you, touching you back for you, giving and plowing the land or whatever you're doing, you know, for him. Isaiah 56, verse 7, I, he says, I will take you to my holy mountain. It's a relationship. It's a back and forth relationship, but it isn't, you don't have to earn it. You don't have to think, I wonder if I'm being taken today to the holy, you know, that's, <laughs> no, you just relax and let the Lord surprise you. That's it. A little treat, you know, uh, I will take you to my holy mountain. I'll make you joyful in my house of prayer. It's his house. If he orchestrates, do it. If not, don't do it. Your burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. You know, all those pretty hard days, your PhDs piled high and deep, all the sacrifices, all the limitations, all the things you've done for the Lord. He knows that. And all that will be accepted like a sacrifice. You know, he'll accept your offerings. I will take you to my holy mountain, make you joyful in his house of prayer. Your burnt offerings and sacrifices will be accepted upon my altar and my house. Again, my house. It's his house, not yours. It's his house. If they've done it right, it's not somebody's famous turf, their club. It's not somebody's, some famous person's worship club or cult, which is out there. That's what I'm saying. 
So we want people to have joy. Joy in the house of the Lord. All right. Joy in the house of the Lord. And it says your burnt offerings. And it says my house will be a house of prayer for all peoples. It will be a culture. See, that's it. It will be a transformed culture, which is a community which people are drawn to. And all kinds and colors will feel free to go all ages because they feel sincerity. They feel respect. People who, people these, people are so smart. They're smarter than most ministers because they've been through hell in their life or they've been through pain or bias they go in there and their quality because they have all see a lot of things are all the things we're teaching that I'm sort of picking with you know sort of finding fault with to stir it up really it's because all of you on TV and all these people a lot of TV and good teaching for many years has made people very astute very and they've had online as well and other you know teaching tapes and ministry things for years plus they're smarter and all this what Wi-Fi and everything. So you have a group that's really a bunch of leaders. you got to train them with respect. They're not all coming to undermine your ministry. Your ministry. That's what we found. And so we're just trying to get that back. Make it sane again. <laughs> sane, not Satan. All right. all right. With that being said, we're grateful for those that have paid the price for us to be here and laid down their lives and prayed for us and taught us and also been through hell. Even though we can say a lot of this accomplished move is really great. We now see where Paul said back in the day, he said, don't say I'm for Apollos. Don't say I'm for Paul. That's first Corinthians one and three. Now we know why. <laughs> It gets to be sects, clubs, systems, legalism, fan clubs, celebrity over time. And the people get addicted to the one person and their kind of flow, their energy, their whatever they've got going, their music, which is human, human carnal nature, but it's not it creates a bias. It creates a clubby bias because the people are now glued to Apollos. Oh yes, we're under Apollos's ministry. It breeds that type of teaching, you know. <laughs> oh, I am from. Uh, no, I'm under Bishop Paul. No, no, no. We we know more because we are under so and so, and that is what we now know <laughs> after being out in the field all these years. And we can say a lot of people never knew that you need to not have cliques, clubs, bias, because it is respecter of person spirit. Now, respecter of person spirit, I had had first hand knowledge <laughs> of respect because I don't know what in the last move, the last 15 years in showbiz, I triggered it, and that's fine. I think, you know, this is how black people must feel when they get racist <laughs> biased against them. Because I do have a more energy than I'm not the usual. They want to control. I think it's a control spirit. See, that's another thing. Don't say I'm for Apollos and part, and part of the Apollos Boys Club. Because that, if you have a, cl a clubby feeling like Boys Club, Girls Club, or any club, it is cronyism. It's easy on you. It's cronyism, but it's a spirit, which is a cult spirit, minor or macro. That's what it is. So Levitical Patriarchum is a giant discovery, giant thing in our land. It can be charismatic, big boss, and occult, white witchcraft, or it could be good old boys. It could be a lot of things. It could be in groups that aren't even really official Christian. They say they are, but they're not non-tongue talking and talking LP so when we look at the fruit in our nation LP Levitical patriarchism is like Saul before he met Jesus before he got delivered when he was pointing finding fault comparing and saying you're not you're not you're not covered you're a church hopper 
We saw you and caught you. You are a false teacher. You know, I will say this. I was raised Baptist. Happy Baptist. Happy Camber Baptist with good theology. So I like Billy Graham. Not that saintly, but, you know, just fun. And it's like, it wasn't until later when I had my own ministry and I got filled with the Spirit and I was out and I was in the, um, you know, right when TV started to get big and they started advertising the Charismatic Magazine, all their conferences, that's when I saw the change in America. The challenges begin for the last 30, in the 80s. Society as well, you know. Highfalutin started the I am for Apollos, I am for big so-and-so, you know. And then who are you under? Which I'd never, it is not Baptist, white Baptist, anyway. So I was there and I could see the difference. And then that is when I would hear, because I'd be with, I was invited, it was like charismatics, but I was usually, I'd been raised denominational, you know, so they don't do that to my knowledge. And black people don't really do it to my knowledge. And I was with a lot of black people. So I never saw, but it was country law. God was sinning. And I never heard the practice of t churches, you know, preachers, the fivefold office ministry of small churches, small, small churches, finding false prophets. That really made an impression on me. I thought, everybody's false to these people. So, of course, I study their doctrine. And that's why, I and then I've seen a lot since. But I think a lot of people call, and, and you can use this as a doctrinal theology to teach from and then examine, see if it's right. My opinion, my red flag is the more they call false prophets, the more they call them witches, the more they call them anything, the more they're doing it. That's what I'm thinking. The more they're false. That's what I think. I think they never confront you. They just assume you are the worst wretch. <laughs> I think that's okay. So my thought is this. My theory is if you examine the theology, point, if you examine the theology of those who call and accuse all these people of being false, usually they are. They're accusing and accusing and saying he's false, she's false, red, you know, Everybody's faults, my opinion, study them, and you're going to find out they're really false. You know, they've got false teaching in there, or le or ignorance, and that could be usually the law, and the boys club, of, or the girls club, whoever, of their group, you know, the doctrinal. So you can help yourself by weeding out from all that flame throwing and most of it is LP or Levitical patriarchism from way back in the country hills I call it the Mountain Williams School of Theology but we're you know there for the grace of God go I really only God's mercy finally finalizing this right here there are Jesus Christ from the Middle East he was the only true teacher, prophet, apostle, all that. So we got to know that and humble ourselves. Then we know that there are such things as everybody's going to have true and everybody's going to have false after that. And there are some that are really false. The goal is for you and me and God to be mature and say, I'm going to ask God to help me not get into the ones that are too much false by mistake. This is what I had. To, I did not know how big it is to have faults like witchcraft occult. I had no clue and what it does. I had to grow. I mean, it it was dysfunct. I had never been around, and I'm a prophet, so I learned things that I, you know, not to do the seer realm. But I also know it affects people. God allowed me grace to discover it in bits and pieces. And that it is really annoying, but it is also prejudice, and it's also defiling visitors just for showing up. So I've gotten on a, you know, a, a stem winder when I get to that to deliver it, really, for the sake of the Book of Acts, Holy Spirit. So you can have your pet doctrine that you know is really wrong and it really bothers you, and you can have ones that don't bother you. So you got to hear God for yourself. Uh, I think usually it's the law, it's the teacher. All right. So there's true and partially true. Then there's really false. So let's discuss that. 
All right, if it's true and partially true, you got to know if they're really true. That means they're really saved. True is they're really saved. But you got to watch them. You got to watch all of us from here on out. You got to watch them anyway. All right, things to go on. So there's true and partially true, and if you're going to go to one that's mostly true, you want to, but if you have the maturity and conscience and you're smart enough and God says, you know, you can stick this one out a while and you know they're off, that's how I felt about LP, you know, the occult, I thought, I didn't know what this was, but I thought it didn't all, but it's really pretty good except for that, <laughs> and later I knew, oh, it's the witchcraft, that's what it is. False authority. See, when I teach charismatics, I respect them. But I never met, there's no other group that has ever done that, the big boss ton. You know, within charismatics, you'll find a remnant here and there. But then you'll find the other kinds as well, the Demas or the, you know, Witch Watchers, Crazy Maddox, Quasi Maddox, and Charismatics. But I respect, hey, I'm not mad. I can. I'm just letting you know it has to be, it's licentious, it's false, it's a disease, and it affects many people. You're, it's playing around, accusing people for showing up. That's all it is. Not spooky, just wrong. So then we find, all right, then they're the real faults. Real faults. All right. I would say, and I've said it before, I'll say it a while, I would say, you got to go first to Paul and you got to go to Ephesians for the common doctrine. If they're really false, it will show up there. This is my opinion. If you want to add me scriptures, if you want to correct me in your theology, if you're an older person and mature and you do it respectfully, <laughs> feel free. Hey, I'm interested. We want to be right. You know, get it right. Paul says to the churches, all right, he said, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of us all. All right, in grace. We get grace for all that. God has graced us. So everyone in a community, Ephesians 4, walking it out in meekness and lowliness and long-suffering and endeavoring to, keep the, endeavoring to keep the bonds of peace together in ministry, in family, in society. You know, that's going to all add up and build up to the transformed community you'll see later in that chapter. But Paul gives, he knows that all these teachings are out there, old and new theology, and everybody's got their doctrine, that there's got to be something that the community can all believe that also proves they're all Christians. They're not all right. Maybe they're not all right because some of them have other beliefs, like they get rid of some of the stuff. You know, some of the teachings of Paul or some of the teachings of Jesus. They believe that the Holy Spirit isn't for today as an example. Or they believe that you got to go to church on, you can only go to church on one kind of church. Or you can only go on Tuesday. You know, whatever they come up with. <laughs> so there is rigid teaching, but it doesn't mean you're not a Christian. That means you got to, you know, it's partial true fault you choose how much you can stand how much you feel ephesians four common doctrine though is to me a criteria that will point out a real false person right away the rest are up to you and prayer talking to people being a good student and really committing to serve god with all your heart one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of us all, is Paul, the common doctrine. To me, a common doctrine, person who believes all that, is really saved. Really saved. That didn't mean they can't go off. That didn't mean they haven't gone off. That didn't mean they got into witchcraft, which God is going to judge false authority. Maybe they're really wrong. But I can't prove everything. You can't either. It's tough. I'm giving you some starter evaluations so the common doctrine is this one lord jesus christ no other one lord one way to heaven jesus even says that no one comes to the father except by me him it says there is a way and there is a way that seems right into a man but it ends in death so you can research that all right one lord probably is the top one right now because people are really really you know messing with that they're really diffusing that. 
One Lord, one faith, the Christian faith, one baptism, baptism in immersion. When you grow up and you're accountable, you can be sprinkled all you want to. But in my opinion, this is my opinion now, you can do, you know, you. I'm submitting it as a sila, that it would make sense that after the person is mature and grown up and really knows God, they would like to go and get immersed as a sign of eternity, washing away their sins as an act of fulfillment. All right. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, the Father of us all. I'm not saying baptism of the Holy Spirit in the book of Acts is the baptism. Why? Because a lot of people call it different things. Jesus was immersed. Jesus was immersed. All right. Last, God, the Father of us all. God, the Father of us all, the global Father. He is a great dad. He is a person who blesses. He is a, you know, the personality of God. He is loving all the colors, styles, and vibes. He's an artist. He is an artist. So with that said, you can study it. But if you go later in the chapter of Ephesians 4, it talks about a transformed Christian community that's not biased, not a club, not one style only and one vibe and one race only. It is everybody led of the Spirit, divine appointment, collaboration in a community. It says, in that transformed community, the things that will really get society's attention in a positive manner. It says there'll be less if we've done our work in ministry. And you can read and pray about it and fill in the gaps that I leave out. It says... <clears throat> The transformed Christian, not the diseased, biased Christian, the real Christian remnant gathering and multiplying, it says it will be less winds of doctrine, less trends of doctrine in that community, less immaturity, less con artists, and all that, you can read it, will get the attention of society. And this is how come... How come I teach to the Christian? I'm teaching to the, I, I give the word of the Lord to you all, the Christian of all colors and persuasions, book of Acts or not, but I don't do it as dogma, autocratic dogma, religion. I'm doing it as a sila because you're smart. You're smart and you will have things that I don't know that you, you know, and also convictions that God wants you to do or you got to weed out like Paul said Paul gave permission to the churches to say know me know my doctrine and my lifestyle but also work out your own salvation I want you to hear what I say I really do but I also understand the turf you got to hear God that's really it so I'm thinking this is a sila if I were to say out of what this is from Cross by the Unity, it is permission to do it differently. It is permission to respect people, but to differ with them, to love them, and to cheer them on, but to be very selective how you handle the Lord and your call and life. I really would. All right, let's go back for a synopsis. We got the organic fellowship, Isaiah 56, verse 7, as a role model to think about. We got the Ephesians 4 doctrine for false prophets right off the bat. But then, this is the last part, you got to know how much and really are these people safe because you're going to get effect affected in the emotional bathwaters, the doctrinal bathwaters that are reproduced by their culture. The doctrinal bathwaters are my vocabulary word. Which means you go into the ministry, you go into the house, you go into the church, and you go in there and you, you're in the emotion, you're in the doctrinal bathwaters. Over time, you'll find out more about it, but right then it looks good, sounds good, they seem nice. That's the thing you gotta really be, you know, really watch for with your doctrine. And a bathwater, when you make a bath, when you get your bath drawn, you wanna have the water clean. This is it. The invisible particles, you don't want anything in those waters that will come out later cling to you like poison or viruses. You don't want any false teaching, especially occult and control and smothering you 
putting you under the evil eye to control you, you do not want that. That's what we're talking about. All right. So after a while, their performance will be good, but the culture will come out, the bathwaters, and that is what we're talking about to diagnose, assess them. Now, see, you can have assessment. You don't accuse them. But there are cruel bathwaters by, if you got a cult or the group is, you know, mean and trying to, you know, like the elders or whatever, they've got false doctrine. And it has been a riot to learn this. And there's some that are so nice. You know, there are a lot of nice ones. So you want to go by the discernment of two scriptures, your fruit of the people. You want to assess the group. They want to assess you. You want to assess the group by, over time, in their staff, their elders, and they, you, and the stranger, you know. You're going to say, are they or are they not one of the Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5, fruit of the Friendly Fire Fellowship? Get out. I don't have time to go into that Second Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Playtime. Dysfunction. Are they... Sizing you up because you're money. First Timothy Paul six five. Another one. Get out. Command. All right. The last part would be this. When you're there, James three seventeen is the fruit that the that is given off in the community by the leaders, the um, prophet, the pastor, the group. Basically, James three seventeen. Or are they tail bearers? Tail bears is bad. You know, that's the second time. That's the friendly fire fellowship. So if they're acting, if they're resembling and abiding in James 3.17, and you should do this in your house and work on it and train people. And I, tr you know, I'm trying to work. I try to live that way. James 3.17 says they emulate the wisdom that comes from above, which is the following. Pure, peaceable, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruit without partiality and without hypocrisy. And you can ask yourself, you're, you know, are they pure? No hidden motives, no secrets, no, no, nothing dirty, but also are they pure, pure motives, joyful, you know, before the Lord, peaceable. Are they always fun and fault? There's always, you know, looking for snakes. They're always looking, you know, they're never happy. Pure, peaceable, easily entreated. They're not stubborn. They don't fight to get their way to win their point. They have to be right all the time. They are. They negotiate relationship respect. Pure, peaceable, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruit. The fruit of the spirit. Galatians five, uh, twenty-two. Excuse me. Galatians five twenty-two twenty-three. Paul, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, meekness, and self-control. Self-government. Wisdom from above is, first of all, pure, peaceable, easily entreated, full of mercy and good fruit, respectful, without partiality. That is a big one. That is respect or person's spirit. Are they biased? Are they, you know, our kind only? We want our color, our style, you know, our whatever, our shape, our look, our money bags, whatever it is. All right. And the last part is, and without hypocrisy, not putting on a show, not, you know, fawning and, you know, falling all over you. And then hypocrites backbiting and undermining and bad character issues that these are James 317 is a character fruit. So you got false teaching and true Ephesians four, basically, and more. And then you got character. And you got stuff that will remain or you got false teaching and showbiz you know you got over time things aren't really what they th you thought it was you thought it was this when it really was not because the culture was impure impure but i said nobody knows it all nobody has it all but this crowd that i've described and learned from that what i had to learn that i teach now is the holy ghost crowd those that say they speak in tongues this is the biggest deal I have ever seen. It really is. But I'm reminded this is why God made a body, a Christian body that nobody owns the turf. He needs different people to add their true doctrine, a bit of it here and there. So we have a collective wholeness, including black people and white people and brown people. 
So I'm I'm submitting the theology of crossbody unity, which is really a heart that nobody, I don't have it all, but we will help you. <laughs> We're collaborators. This is Galatians 1, 1 and 2, like Paul. Paul ended up being his own office, not sent out by any one group, any one person. I and the brothers and sisters that are with me out in the field co-laboring, that's us. That's what this is. It is looks like a white person. God uses it to shock everybody, I guess. But I have a real multicultural vibe. I really do. <laughs> and uh, a lot of joy. So we want you to hear God. We want you to improve. We want you to hear God and directly go and teach and train and confront in a loving and respectful manner. And get this thing going again. We got a lot more to do before the Lord returns. We really do. God is good. And we are praying. What I don't need is people just to sign on. I would like prayer for direction of our location. I have two locations I need. I need the right. I need a mature representative. It's time now to get the representative. That is my buffer that can help me get it. You know, so I've got so much to think about and do. The representative that is sent, that will be my, you know, that type of thing. But also the locations for me and this ministry where he needs it. And I do have a really diverse vibe. And what I would like for the ministry, I know that I need to have something in Charlotte. I have that vibe. But I also have the South Carolina vibe, which I like. So I like both. But I'm also online for anyone who needs to chat, get wisdom, the, uh, tutoring and theology, racism, relationships, all these types of things. I'm online. We can confer online and chat or on land. But also mine is more humble prayer protection, humble people that are in our, our relationship network. And this is it. We're not... Cross-body unity is not to have members. It's to have people who feel sent by the Spirit or not. It's divine appointment because you can't do it all and you shouldn't try. So that's what we're doing. God is so good and we are so grateful. If I left anything out, please forgive me. We're trying to get it all down when we can. But it's God. It's God that is good. It's God that sins. It's God that needs to have his name famous. <laughs> his move, not mine. It's got to be God for all of us. really does. This is good. God is good. Thank you so much for listening. This is Tavo D'Arcy. And if you have a question, just write me at dfwleader at gmail.com. G, excuse me, dfwleader at gmail.com. Even though we are sent to Dallas... We went to Dallas, and we're still sent there online, but we live South Carolina, North Carolina, border, Charlotte area. Okay. God bless. Bye-bye.